Uh, hello and and uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sam Zarifi. I'm the Secretary General of the International Commission of Jurists, and uh, welcome to this discussion. Obviously, of keen interest to you and uh, many others about uh, the end of the rule of law, and there is a question mark at the end of that. I'm uh, grateful to see the level of interest in this issue. Uh, this is a question that has risen and comes up in the work of the ICJ recently all the time. It is a beautiful day. The fact that you're here shows that there is real alarm about the end of the rule of law. But I want to give a, a quick answer to that in case any of you really feel like you have to run outside and not lose the sunshine for the rest of the summer. So a spoiler alert, you may want to close your eyes, close your ears if you want to not hear what I'm about to say, but uh, it is not the end of the rule of law. I, I hope that is the takeaway from, uh, uh, from this discussion. But there is clearly a higher risk to the rule of law around the world and in the international system, uh, certainly compared with, with, say, around 10 years ago. And so uh, the message from me as the Secretary General of the ICJ and I think the takeaway will be keep calm and keep fighting. Uh, the ICJ has been working on, on the rule of law for quite some time, for about 65 years, slightly longer. And in that time, we've done quite a bit to define and defend the rule of law. Uh, and just a reminder that in the ashes of the, of the Second World War and the new international legal system, the rule of law was included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, and in the UDHR, it was stated that it is essential, I'm sorry about the language, the language is archaic now, it is essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. Obviously very high level of importance for the rule of law, but an instrumental protectionist thing. People around the world have to be careful lest people stand up and, and rebel. Uh, through the ICJ's work in those early years, especially in the 1950s, the concept was developed significantly beyond that. And by 1959, when the ICJ gathered in Delhi and issued the Declaration of Delhi, the rule of law was, was explained as a dynamic concept for the expansion and fulfillment of which jurists are primarily responsible and which should be employed not only to safeguard and advance the civil and political rights of the individual in a free society, but also to establish social, economic, educational, and cultural conditions under which his legitimate aspirations and dignity may be realized. And from then on, I think, uh, through the work of the ICJ, through the work of uh, civil society through the work of many governments around the world, this concept and the inextricable link between the rule of law and human rights was incorporated deeper and deeper into the international system so that by 2012, uh, the General Assembly held its uh, high-level meeting and in its high-level resolution 67-1, the uh, leaders of the world essentially got together and said, we reaffirm that human rights the rule of law and democracy are interlinked and mutually reinforcing and that they belong to the universal and indivisible core values and principles of the United Nations. At that point, the ICJ could have declared victory and moved on. But history did not stop there. And it is clear that in the years since 2012, and especially most recently in the last two or three years, we have seen a new set of challenges to, to the rule of law, both within countries, but also to the international legal order, in a way that we really had not seen before. Uh, countries that had previously been known for violating human rights continue to do so, but other countries that previously had at least rhetorically been champions of the rule of law and international human rights also began questioning the need for international human rights, began to question the legitimacy of the framework and to question the legitimacy of rule of law as a principle in international law. In places, and I'm just listing in no particular order, 
as they come to my mind, in the Philippines, in China, the US, Poland, Hungary, Cambodia, Venezuela, Burundi. These challenges were articulated by leaders brazenly in a way that we hadn't seen before. It was to some extent the end of shame, the end of hypocrisy. Previously, people would say they defended human rights, but they felt free to violate it. Now we start seeing rulers who very openly say that they don't care about human rights and they don't care about the international rule of law system. Uh, this growth of authoritarian populism, uh, which accompanies this, riding on, on a platform of new technology and, and social media, uh, seems to assert that the people, whether it's the majority or some asserted notion of the people, their will can trump any notion of rule of law, any conceptual notions and constitutional defenses of human rights and the rights of minorities. They question whether the rule of law matters, whether judges should be castigated as elites, whether bad judgments or bad reports are fake news, and whether judiciaries should be weaponized as a tool not for protecting human rights, but of facilitating repression. And that's why we have this question, is this the end of the rule of law? Part of the answer of the, of, of the ICJ, and I think what you will hear, is that we have had darker times and we have had a history that it is important to keep in mind. I want to cite, going back to the Declaration of Delhi that I mentioned in 1959, what the Prime Minister of India at the time, Jawaharlal Nehru, said when he was speaking to the ICJ in 1959. He said, this International Commission of Jurists has a tremendous responsibility of looking at this changing world, changing before our eyes from day to day. There is a change in social relationships, in the relationships of nations with each other, Intimate contacts between countries arise all over the world. Distances are annihilated. Every country is practically the neighbor of another country. These changes were unknown in the old days when international law or any other kind of law was considered. This could have been said today, absolutely. And it, and it reflects to some extent perhaps that there is no need for fear or despair, that the rule of law and human rights has always fought in a system since World War II where technology has seemed to move very quickly forward. So from the ICJ, I want to be able to say, and, and I hope uh, we will hear more, that the rule of law, we have to be clear and we have to be able to articulate that it is something that helps the world, something that helps individuals, that it is a principle that elevates democracy from mob rule and is necessary to harness the energy of democracy and give it a direction and progression toward the protection and promotion of, of human rights and sustainable development for the betterment of the lives of people around the world. So I would say it is not the end of the rule of law. We've been here before, but we do need to be very careful about how we address this current very serious challenge. That is the ICJ's mission. That is our mandate. And we seek your assistance, we seek your advice, and your support. And I'm grateful that many of you are here to, uh, to, uh, to join us in this. I want to thank the Graduate Institute very, very much for giving us this opportunity uh, and for their ongoing collaboration with us. And I also want to thank the German Mission in Geneva for, for their support, for spreading the word. And I want to thank our colleagues from RIDH, the International Network who are, uh, for Human Rights, who are live streaming this. For people who are interested in finding this or are linking to it, I, you should go to at RIDH Global and you will find uh, the live stream of, of, of this session. And uh, I hope that this is for us the beginning of a discussion in Geneva at international institutions but around the world. And to kick us off on that, I want to, I'm, and I'm quite delighted and, and proud to be able to introduce uh, the ICJ's um, acting president, Professor Robert Goldman of the American University Washington College of Law, uh, a longtime commissioner of the ICJ. And many of you already know Professor Goldman. Uh, he was a member of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, and he was its president uh, in 1999 and 2000. 
in another guise, he uh, was the UN Human Rights Commission's independent expert on the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms while countering terrorism. He was a member, uh, a key member of the International Commission of Jurists' uh, eminent jurists panel on counterterrorism and, and human rights. It, he Also very relevant for today, he helped develop the normative framework for inter internally displaced people and was a principal author of the guiding principles on, on IDPs. So he is someone who has fought this battle uh, uh, in, in many different places and on many different dimensions. And I'm uh, very proud to uh, have him as our president and to hand over to him this discussion as the moderator for this session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sam, and, and uh, welcome to everybody. And again, I would reiterate uh, our thanks to the Graduate Institute for this uh, providing us this uh, great venue and for all the cooperation that's existed in the past and hopefully I think in the future. Uh, my job today is simple. I got to keep these people on task. And so let me just say uh, I am an American, but unlike uh, what has become very fashionable in my country, if you exceed your time, I will not send a tweet telling you that you're fired. <laughs> I will merely pass you a note indicating that time is about to expire. And the operating rules are basically we're going to ask for initial uh, 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 presentation of around seven minutes uh, from each of the panelists. And then the idea will be to open it up to the floor so that we can get questions. Uh, I trust that uh, the more elaborate bios uh, are, are, have been distributed with the people. Uh, okay, let's put it this way. If I had to read the complete bio of people up here, we would exhaust a lot of time. Uh, I think you can trust me. I'm going to give the most relevant things about them, but they were specifically chosen because they are highly accomplished people. And uh, we are going to start the first presentation uh, is a, a dear close friend, Professor Carlos Ayala, who is the ICJ's vice president and uh, former president of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I had the great pleasure of serving for four years with Carlos. Okay, Carlos, please. Uh, Thank you uh, to Bob Coleman for trying to keep our time rightly. And thank you, you all, for uh, coming today to this important event on the question to, of the end of the rule of law. Uh, since I am the first to speak, um, I want to say a few uh, sort of more theoretical principles, uh, statements about rule of law, and then give you the example of my own country, uh, Venezuela, uh, about how the dismantling of the rule of law has affected the protection of human rights and democracy. Uh, well, first of all, uh, rule of law uh, is procedures, is organs, but it's not only procedure and organs, it's also substantive and material outcome of those procedures and organs. So that's why principles like separation of powers and principles of the content and standards of human rights are important for the rule of law. Uh, so we, we do not have this kind of formalistic approach to the rule of law, but also a material and substantive approach. Uh, secondly, nowadays, the rule of law is not only what we used to call the constitutional rule of law, it's also the international rule of law. So governments are subject not only to the rules of the constitutions, but are subject also to international law, whether uh, it is um, containing treaties or uh, customary international law or uh, 
let's say, public order, uh, uh, international law. So the states cannot get rid of the rule of law without violating both the domestic uh, uh, constitution and the international law. And thirdly, uh, the rule of law cannot be overlooked or overpassed or, let's say, unobserved by a decision of the majorities. There are principles, there are values of the rule of law that are not up to the majorities. They are, in this sense, counter-majoritarian. So the case is that when the rule of law is destroyed, the human rights and the persons are at risk. And let's take the case of Venezuela, which has been the subject of studies by the International Commission of Juries uh, of at least three reports that you can find in our webpage. Since 1999, the implementing of the new constitution has been pending on the political will. So since 1999, what the constitution called for judges, independent judges, has not been implemented, implemented since almost 80% of the judges are provisional judges that are freely appointed and can be freely dismissed without any due cause, without any process, and without the right to appeal. The Supreme Court was appointed by a political majority with members of the governing party, and so the rest of the constitutional powers established there. They were to obey the aims of the revolution. The laws can no longer be an obstacle to achieve the goals of the revolution for the good of the people. So in this situation, and I'm, I have to be very brief in this introduction, uh, citizens began to resort to international bodies, both at the OES and at the UN. Especially with the familiarity of the inter-American system, the inter-American system published country report, sent cases to the court, and those cases were telling what was happening. They were cases about the lack of independence of judges, judges that were arbitrarily dismissed, freedom of expression cases, the shutdown of um, newspapers and, 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 and networks. And at that time, the government decided that since they won hands-free on these issues, uh, and they already had it at the domestic level, they decided to denounce the American Convention on Human Rights. So the cases um, continue to flow also to the UN system, and I have a list of uh, several uh, reports and decisions made at the UN level, both at the treaty bodies, uh, the political bodies, and the special procedures. But then, this is interesting, this was a case where the government had a majority in not completely, but fair elections at that time. But once they lost the majority in 2015, where the opposition won two-thirds of the National Assembly, they used the tool of the politicized and control courts to vacate the constitutional powers of the Congress, of Congress. So each and every law that was passed by Congress, each and every decision to control the executive as established in the Constitution, each and every decision to investigate uh, through the Parliament, through parliamentary procedures, was declared null and void in few days and sometimes hours. So the government used the tool of the politicized constitutional court to vacate Congress and the political will of the majority in Congress. Once that happened, they called for a constitutional assembly. But it was not a, through universal elections. 
it was called a constitutional assembly through sectors of the society. So they established that the fishermen will constitute a sector, some workers will be a sector, uh, students will be a sector, but not everybody will be in that sector. Uh, the majority of the population won't be organized in those sectors, so some people wouldn't have the vote to that constituent assembly. The Constituent Assembly was elected and is now working. Uh, it has already been working for eight months. They haven't written a word of a new constitution, but they have now passed laws. They have uh, appointed the new Attorney General. They have dismissed the Attorney General arbitrarily. And they are doing all kinds of things because they have decided, and this is written in their statute, that the Constitution is no longer in effect. The rules of the game, the rules of the government, are the rules established by the Constituent Assembly. The, their decisions are not subject to judicial review. They are above the Constitution. So this is the end of the rule of law, actually, the establishment of this Constituent Assembly as elected and with the powers that I have uh, outline. And right now, for the 20th of May, they have called for presidential elections, even though the term is not over. But the political parties of the opposition, the most important ones, of course, have been illegalized. And the most important opposition leaders were disqualified. So again, we will see something that will be called elections. But these are not fair and free elections, so the world is prepared. At least the democratic world has expressed that they will not recognize the outcome of the elections. We cannot have democracy and human rights in Venezuela unless the rule of law is reestablished, unless we have, again, separation of powers, unless, again, we establish a system of courts, unless we have an independent Congress elected to pass law uh, through representative of the people. So this affects not only, let's say, the big investments which are not coming in the country right now, but this affects the common citizen. People is now starving, people is now lacking the basic goods, the basic medicines, the, mas the basic um, medical treatments, and this is what we are ending up with the end of the rule of law in the case of Venezuela. There is the end of democracy and human rights, which is affecting the whole population. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Patricia Schultz, who currently is a member of the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Patricia. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank the organizers for giving me a chance to present some reflections on the rule of law in a gender perspective based on my experience as a member of this CEDAW committee. We are tasked with monitoring the implementation of the CEDAW convention ratified by 189 states. In over seven years, I have participated in the adoption of 170 concluding observations and recommendations called COBS addressed to the states that have reported to us. I also participated in the adoption of the recommendations for 70 individual communications and four inquiries based on the optional protocol ratified by 109 states. So how do we deal in the committee with the issue of the rule of law explicitly or implicitly. Explicitly, when we are dealing with failed or quasi-failed states, that's when the committee uses the terms of rule of law most often. 
Um, these are clear-cut cases where the rule of law does not operate on all or most part of the territory of the state and may actually never have functioned. So we are sometimes faced not with the end of the rule of law in a country, but with its ongoing existence since the creation of the country, linked to the incapacity of the nation-state model to bring the rule of law. Drafting concluding observations to try and aid the national authorities in those cases can be a surrealistic exercise, but we have to think long term. Implicit reference to the law, rule of law is made in other cases. The committee is often addressing states where the rule of law may operate in certain fields, but not all, when one looks at the situation of women and girls. A number of factors contribute to the disruption of the rule of law. In these cases, the committee generally does not address the problem under the terminology of rule of law, but rather under that of access to justice, access to health care, education, social protection, etc. It thus addresses the symptoms of the lack of or insufficient respect of the rule of law in various fields. Often, this is a question of financing. Money tells of priorities. The budgets for gender equality measures are often small, completely inadequate to reach the proclaimed aims. For instance, access to justice by women is very often rendered impossible because of the very low priority given to the budget of the Ministry of Justice. Therefore, legal aid is unavailable for the majority of women needing it. In addition, the conditions to access legal aid are often very strict. The judiciary and police are not always, and very often are not, gender aware, gender competent, and gender sensitive. The justice system is slow and biased against women, and sometimes, when it is corrupt, it aggravates the bias against women. These factors discourage women to try to defend their rights, even when they know they have rights, which is not always the case. One positive development is the recent adoption in December of the Bellagio Declaration on State Obligations and the role of judiciary in ensuring justice-based violence. This was adopted by judges and I think it's an extremely important instrument because um, uh, judges are and I'm, with all due respect, um, judges are sometimes reticent to capacity building coming from outside sources. Almost in all countries, there is insufficient will and money to fight gender-based violence efficiently. Even in rich countries, only about half the demands for a place in a shelter are satisfied. Even in rich countries with good laws against gender-based violence, there is a huge implementation gap. A recent study shows in a Western country that out of 1,000 sexual assaults, 33 are reported to the police, 29 recorded as crime, 12 lead to charges, 6 are prosecuted, 3 lead, lead to conviction, Nine, 997 assailants walk free. Austerity measures are another uh, element that we are frequently confronted with, which affect the respect for the rule of law in countries where it was not or only haltingly implemented and in countries where it used to be implemented to a large extent. Indeed, austerity measures taken in many countries, rich and poor, affect women disproportionately as they concern public budgets, budgets that are the most important for women and the children and other dependent persons for whom they care. Education, health, transport, food, sanitation, legal aid, shelters for victims of gender-based violence, for instance. Cuts in those budgets mean that the state is no longer able to provide the protection that the rule of law should ensure. We have seen this in some European countries where women's access to health care, especially reproductive health, has been effective. We see this in poor countries where cuts in the budget for transport and or education affect the financing of transport of children to go to school, their uniforms, school supplies and meals. Families must then make a cruel choice of which child or children to continue sending to school when there is not enough money for all of them to pay for the bus, the uniforms, the school supplies and the meals. In view of the prevailing gender stereotypes, priority is generally given to boys. 
We also see a worrying trend regarding women's bodily autonomy. The rule of law should mean that all women and men are entitled to make their own decisions on how they interact with each other in the private and public spheres. Yet we see more and more situations where women's rights are curtailed. They are obliged to wear certain clothes to ensure their modesty. They are no longer allowed to participate in public spaces where they used to have a voice, and they see a progressive curtailing of their rights to decide if and when they want to have children and how many. This is the case, for instance, in countries where sexual and reproductive rights are closing down. In some of these countries, abortion used to be legal and accessible. More and more laws are adopted to restrict access to abortion to the point of making it illegal, except when the life of the woman or girl is concerned. Even access to information on sexuality is restricted through attacks against comprehensive sexual education in schools. We are also confronted in the committee with the closing of public spaces through limitations of the right of NGOs to receive foreign funding on increasingly difficult conditions to fulfill for them to be recognized and allowed to function as an NGO and confronted also to abusive use of criminal law by some states to curtail the activities of women human rights defenders. In all these cases, the rule of law is not respected as fundamental freedoms are no longer recognized and respected, such as freedom of opinion, expression and assembly, which are indispensable for women to fight for gender equality and non-discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is not a uh, stranger in this venue. Uh, Professor Andrew Clapham, who is Professor of Public International Law uh, at the Graduate Institute and currently is a member of the UN Commission on Human Rights in South Sudan, and he's quite an elegant writer, I would add. <laughs> Thank you for that elegant introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Welcome to the Graduate Institute. Thank you to the International Commission of Jurists for putting on this event. Um, quite a lot has been said about the rule of law. I'm going to go down to the next level and look at the relationship between human rights and international criminal law. In the longer version of the flyer, it does say that as part of the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, we might want to think about the extent to which human rights law has led to prosecutions under criminal law. And we have a distinguished judge from the ICC, and I don't want to trespass on her pitch. But um, I thought it would be useful and maybe even a little provocative to suggest that this is not necessarily a simple story of progress um, in the sense that in 1948 we had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there was talk then about having a high commissioner and an international criminal court. Then in 1993, um, some of you might have been there, but uh, many of you not, there was the Vienna World Conference on Human Rights, and there were initiatives from civil society pushing hard for a new UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and the ICJ, in fact, through its very effective and intelligent um, representative at the time, not me, um, Mona Rishmawi, uh, was pushing for the International Criminal Court um, in Vienna as an outcome of that conference. And as you know, the International Criminal Court um, was adopted as a statute in 1998, a few years later, through the result of a massive campaign of civil society and a number of governments very much involved, including, of course, the German government, who's hosting. So it all sounds great that we have human rights, we have an international criminal court, we have the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and all of this is sort of pushing towards not the end of the rule of law, but the implementation of the rule of law. And indeed, um, it's been mentioned that I've been working on South Sudan, and there we have a human rights crisis. I don't think that will be news to anyone. And our methodology is to work out um, the violations of human rights and who is responsible. But the mandate also talks about identifying those responsible for related crimes. And so the tension now begins to emerge. But nevertheless, one can accuse the government of violating human rights, of violating the African Charter and the Universal Declaration. But actually, 
you don't get much traction. Nobody really cares. But when you start to phrase it as international criminal responsibility and the prospect of appearing in The Hague before the International Criminal Court or before a new hybrid court um, to be established for South Sudan, people start to pay attention. And within international criminal law, you can do things that you can't do in human rights law. You can put individuals in prison and you can build a theory of command responsibility that even if somebody didn't do it, they might have had people under their command who did and they should have known about it and they should have punished them. And those people, you get their attention. So all of this looks as though we're heading in a rather effective direction. Why am I setting this up as a provocative comment? Because I think there are some problems emerging. And I'll mention two incidents from the last month that um, happened to me and that made me think about this, knowing that I was going to be on this panel and addressing this question. So the first, I was talking to a journalist and explaining the human rights situation in South Sudan, but more generally in other places. And she said, yes, but you know, what about the crimes against humanity? What about genocide? Shouldn't we be talking about genocide and crimes against humanity? And I realized that unless I could phrase what I wanted to draw to her attention in terms of international criminal law, the journalists were not interested. And I said, no, but there's much more to human rights than talking about crimes against humanity and genocide. And she said, no, but that's the most serious. That's the real sort of core of human rights. And I think we are in danger of losing the universality and the ideas in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by focusing on genocide and chemical weapons, to sort of raise it now. Um, here we are in a situation where, when I deal with victims groups, the sort of first thing that they're interested in doing is getting into the genocide box or the victims of chemical weapons box, because that's where you get attention. And the rest of human rights is in danger of being overtaken a little, not by the International Criminal Court's agenda. I think it's great that the International Criminal Court exists. I was in Rome. I'm a big supporter. I don't want to be misunderstood. But there's a danger when we talk about the rule of law or being a human rights organization of thinking it's all about prosecutions. Now, the second incident was at the Human Rights Council, and I went to the Human Rights Council to hear the sort of roundup of human rights in the world, um, hoping that they would mention South Sudan. And in fact, uh, they didn't, but they did mention a lot of situations which they thought should be on the agenda of the ICC. And so I took a note, actually, of the situation of human rights in the world, but the issues that were at the forefront of the Human Rights Council's agenda as presented by the High Commissioner, and again, it's not a criticism of him, I'm just highlighting this for you, was the prosecutions in Libya setting up a special mechanism for Myanmar, the ICC getting jurisdiction over North Korea, special court for Central African Republic, special mechanism on criminal law for Syria, special mechanism, no, sorry, ICC jurisdiction over Libya, special mechanism for Burundi, and ICC jurisdiction over the Philippines. So eight situations. And this is not a criticism, as I say, of the High Commissioner, but afterwards, when I wanted to speak to journalists and to generally take the temperature as to where we are in human rights, the main story is what the High Commissioner had said about getting Myanmar on an international criminal agenda, or making sure that the Philippines are prosecuted in the ICC, or the, the leader of the Philippines, I should say. And that does make it difficult for somebody who wants to work on human rights in Austria, or Australia, even. I mean, what's happened to the human rights movement if it's all focused on how do we get something into the ICC? And lots of cases will never get to the ICC because of jurisdictional questions or because of the role of the Security Council. And I just wanted to sound those alarm bells um, as we sort of suggest that this is all progress um, and that human rights and international criminal law is all part of the same endeavor that the human rights movement is on. I'm beginning to see um, a bit of a zero-sum game that you can't, I mean, I think it ought to be possible for the High Commissioner and for an organization like the ICJ or Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or the New York Times to concentrate on human rights and think about international criminal law. But my experience in talking to journalists, my experience with the media, and even in class, I know some of my students are here at the moment, people are very keen to say, let's take this to the ICC. And all this human rights stuff, it's all too slow and not exciting enough. And I have news, we're not going to get 
everybody who's committed an international crime in the ICC. It's going to be very, very few people, as I'm sure you'll hear. Now I've got my two-minute warning, and I thought I would finish with this point. Having expressed a little warning about the utility of international criminal law when dealing with a human rights or an international law matter, I'm now going to backtrack and contradict myself and suggest that if we're thinking about the strikes by the United Kingdom, France and the United States on Syria, actually the Universal Declaration on Human Rights might not give us the answer as to whether the rule of law was violated. Even the UN Charter, we are being told, allows for an exception for humanitarian intervention or is maybe not that relevant because we're interested in the legitimacy rather than the legality of it. And that seems to be the message from the French foreign minister when they talk about saying question est-ce que c'est légitime as opposed to légal. Now, moving to the international criminal law framework, we now have in the International Criminal Court the crime of aggression. And whether or not we can decide whether the strikes were a violation of the UN Charter or whether they are somehow against the spirit of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think an international criminal court judge would have to decide whether or not the rule of law had been violated by the leaders of those countries, should there be a prosecution for aggression in that court. Now, to be clear, I know that it can't be done because those three countries will not accept the jurisdiction of the court. But I think if we're interested in thinking about the rule of law and whether those strikes violate the rule of law, actually using the international criminal law framework and the crime of aggression might be more helpful than some of the other suggestions that are on the table. And I'll stop there, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, our next speaker uh, is no stranger to Geneva, uh, His Excellency uh, Luis Gaixeros who is the uh, permanent representative of Ecuador to the United Nations. And I understand on two previous occasions that uh, you have been here in Geneva, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. First of all, my thanks to the ICG for this, uh, ICJ for this invitation. And uh, thank the, the Graduate Institute for, for holding this meeting. Uh, let me just say that this is, this is my third round in Geneva. And I have been vice chair of the Human Rights Commission and the Human Rights Council at the same time. So I, I was thinking about the question in, in, in reality. Uh, and the, the question that, 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 I, that I pose is, uh, is there a rule of law? And, si and since when it, did it begin? It began after the Second World War, after Europe and uh, the war in Europe killed between 50 to 80 million. Is that the, the answer? We formulated a, a, a conceptualization of the law, or did it come since we have nation states in the Pact of Westphalia? Or wh what type of laws are we talking about that, that we are concerned with? Because I do, uh, I, I, I have to agree uh, with, with what uh, was said here. I am a believer in, the, in, in change. I, I, I began to believe in change as a, as a method of life, uh, reading, of course, the Greek classics as Heraclitus, where you stand in the stream of water and everything changes. Uh, but I do think that there's a change for the positive and a change for the negative. And in my more than 50 years of a career diplomat, I've seen uh, not only the evolution toward the right conception of defending human rights and law, but also a regression because those who have visited, like me, the mass graves in, 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 in the ex-Yugoslavia are a testimony to what people can do to each other, not to talk about Rwanda and not to talk about others. Uh, as we talk about uh, the, the instatement of the rule of law, it's, it's not a simple question. It's not a single question either. I think we have to look at these, as, at these situations not only on the guise of what is structured uh, as as law or what we defend as a structure of law or, 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 what, my, my, the, or, or what the professor was just saying now the, and, and what we've been talking about, the, the difference between legitimacy and, legal, and legality. So it, it, it's, it's legitimate to bomb when I think it's necessary to bomb. If my political stake is at, in order, is it, 
Is it legal to do so without the authorization of the Security Council? Where do nation states in the realm of small nation states without nuclear weapons stand? In this? Yeah. Of course, anecdotally, I have to tell you that I've been at this for a long time, so I can tell you the reference of this. We were talking about the humanitarian effects of nuclear war in Oslo, and we had a conference. And this conference, all, all the nations of the world went except the P5s. So when I asked the P5, why didn't you come to Oslo to talk about the humanitarian effects of a nuclear weapon? And they said, well, you were there, but it's like a meeting of NGOs because we possess the weapons, and if we're not there, it's not a meeting. So what is the rule of law? Uh, we are seeing in the international trade community a grave preoccupation on the changes that one of its principal founders imposed on the world in, in the economics. So now uh, we have a, an insecurity and, uh, and a non-dependability, and uh, now we're, we're in front of trade wars, possible trade wars, or the liberation of treaties, treaties which were signed and are being abrogated and renegotiated as we speak. So in, in reality, are we talking about the formulation of the rule of law as per se, as a, as a structure which we, we defend? And when it comes to human rights, I, I sometimes am appalled about the use of human rights. Because we also have to talk about how countries use this geopolitically and how the council is politicized to one side or the other. Now, my, my, my take in this is that you have a human being which needs defending, whose rights need defending against the state, against how the state does this. But we have transnational crimes that sovereignty of states, territorial sovereignty of states cannot deal with. Migration. Is anybody speaking about the consequences of migration in the United States and the application of measures or in Europe? Is anyone going to take this as a, as a, as a resolution to the, to, the, to the Human Rights Council or the Security Council? Are we going to take this into the realm of refugees? How are we going to do this? Or is it a regression? Now that we have a problem that has been created in the Middle East and we have a flow of migrants and refugees to Europe, suddenly we have governments in Europe to the tendency of right anti-migrants in general. And sometimes racist and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, eth uh, eth ethnically uh, questioned. Are we going to deal with this in the treaty bodies? I was a member of the Committee Against Torture, so I'm very familiar with the work the CEDAW does. And what the, is the High Commissioner's Office uh, capable of doing this with a budget of 3% of the UN? Mm -hmm. And a concentration on Western, on, on Western employees more than anywhere else in the world? because it depends on a voluntary contribution. So that's a criticism to the system. It's not to say it or, 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 or to how we do this. But undoubtedly, uh, if I reference the Pope, and, I, and I'm going to quote him, he said, humanity should question itself more, once more about the observed and unfair, uh, unfair phenomenon of war on whose stage of death and pain only remains standing the negotiating table and that could and should have prevented it. Do we have the capacity of dialogue? Do we have the capacity of negotiation? Rules-based negotiation. The, undoubtedly, the, the group that is, has been attempting to, to have a solution in Syria is not there. There are too many components in the conflict in Syria to have a, 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 result, a resolution of the problem. But it, it, it has extended itself into the rigid, religious confrontation between Sunnis and Shiites. And so now we have uh, a, a dimension of a problem which maybe we did not have a few years back, which is the conflict of religions. How do we solve human rights and the problems of religion? Now, uh, we have been talking about internal problems of countries who believe that uh, the legal standards that were uh, applicable, that they signed international conventions, are no longer there, but the, the rule of populism prevails. And some of them tweet. And you know, the, the concept is, uh, uh, on, on this, it's not new. It's been happening with populism for decades. Not the tweeting. The tweeting is new. <laughs> but uh, just, just, as, ju just to be uh, provocative in, in, in the discussion, of course, my country has had 
a participation in the, in, in the construction of, a, a, of the structure of human rights, both in the Commission, which is up and down, which I have to recognize. But uh, the first High Commissioner of Human Rights was an Ecuadorian. And he presided over the negotiation to create the High Commissioner's Office. What he found was that he didn't have the resources to manage the Commission of Human Rights because they were simply weren't there. If you look at the practical problems of, of the High Commissioner's Office, you'll see that there are more violations of human rights that the High Commissioner's Office should deal with than there are people to denounce them. And when he denounces something, the backlash can lead to his non-reelection. There hasn't been a High Commissioner re-elected in, 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 in the sense. Um, we have a world which is, is, is a preoccupation for all of us who we, uh, who will, we will leave to our, our daughters and sons and, and grandchildren. Is there a rule of law that we think is an imperative and obligation for the rest? If we're talking about the International Criminal Court, what you just heard is that the majority of those who are powerful are not members of the Statute of the International Criminal Court and will not accept the jurisdiction of that. So we can take countries that, st that sign the statute and they go to the criminal court, but if you're talking about the, the crime of aggression or you're talking about uh, a, a war that is conducted on, eth on, uh, on non-ethical principles uh, that is not subject to the charter, uh, we bomb. And uh, that's how Iraq began. My, my, uh, my purpose here is to tell you that, of course, the Universal uh, Declaration has left a value, uh, an imprint of values and, and ethics, and should guide the, pro the, the process of human rights. Uh, my question is, can we make it work with the mechanisms we have as the Human Rights Council or the High Commissioner or the committees on, uh, that we have in the, in the, in the treaty bodies and, and the regional commissions? And, and the political will of the countries to, uh, to apply it. Do we have that? Or we, are we still in a process of progression where some countries accept it, some are not? Some are, are signaled as, uh, as, uh, as, the, as, as, as the bandits of the group and others are not. Uh, I'd like to really see sometime the, the Council on, on, uh, on Human Rights uh, treat a problem of the, of, of the developed countries. It would, be, it would be interesting to see how many votes you would get in the political atmosphere of a resolution condemning actions by the developed countries. Because that is not the reality of, the, of a very politicized body. Uh, my, my column here is, in order to have the rule of law, we have to have ethics. We have to have the conviction and the political will of the nation states and of the society and of the NGOs to look at this as a holistic approach on defending the rights of a human being. But that begins in one's inner soul when one sees a person with a disability or a person with a different race. If he is capable of overcoming the prejudices, the ignorance, even, I would say, the educational barriers that are put in the social atmospheres of our countries. And I'm talking about all of us. So while we don't have that, we should strive for that in order to have an adequate rule of law. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. We're going to hear from uh, Sanji uh, Monagang, who is an ICJ commissioner and also a judge at the International Criminal Court at The Hague. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'll speak from the position of a judge of the International Criminal Court. And um, we have heard a lot about the rule of law. What I'm going to do is to demonstrate with a very small example the effort that uh, the ICC is putting into actualizing the provisions or some of the provisions of the UDHR. In 1988, when the Rome Statute was adopted, 
Um, this was one of the greatest achievements of the international community. And the statute creates or establishes the International Criminal Court. The principle is that those who commit serious crimes, that is crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, and the crime of aggression now, will be held accountable so that it cannot be business as usual. And this is what the ICC is about. The ICC epitomizes the philosophy that, and I quote, the most important thing in solving human rights problems is that we have to acknowledge their existence and dare to face up to them, end of quote. The ICC is not a human rights court, but the Rome Statute at Article 21 enjoys, enjoins the court at all levels to apply and interpret the law consistently with internationally recognized human rights and be without any adverse distinction founded on grounds such as gender, which refers to both sexes. Through its work, the ICC has turned the lofty ideals of the UDHR, for example, prohibition of torture, liberty of the person into tangibles. The court delivers justice to that voiceless woman and her child out there. And to that extent, we have moved to real life situations, to delivery, to redress, and therefore practically implementing the ideals of the UDHR, as I have just said. Now, by way of example, in an effort to ensure that sexual violence crimes are given due recognition, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has come up with a policy on sexual violence crimes. The policy provides the framework within which the prosecutor's office investigates and determines the appropriate charges regarding sexual violence. It also provides guidance on how to sensitively interact with victims of the four crimes under the Rome Statute. As a result, enhancing the investigation and prosecution of sexual violence crimes has been elevated to the strategic goal of her office, of the prosecutor's office. And as such, each and every integrated team of the Office of the Prosecutor must put a deliberate focus on these crimes from the stage of developing a case hypothesis. This, <clears throat> this continues into the stage of investigation and, and the plans. And each plan should have a specific component of sexual violence crimes. That should include the integrated team strategy. Potential challenges to access information and how to overcome them should be highlighted. If the integrated team decides that there is no need to focus on such crimes because they do not meet the gravity th threshold, the team should provide a written justification for such conclusion. Now, I want to share a little story with you as we talk to survivors of sexual violence. A survivor said this, and I quote, apart from raping me multiple times, they shot at and destroyed my cooking pots. And I can no longer cook for my family. I have no money to replace the pots. End of quote. For me, this was a mouthful. And for our purposes, and I agree with uh, one of my colleagues who says that the rule of law is all encompassing. And I think organizations like mine 
should have a mind, a change of mindset a little bit, because it is not only about the rape of the women. There are other issues which, are, which have affected her even more. Now, as a result of this deliberate effort that I've articulated in the prosecutor's office, the two on, on, ongoing cases, the Ongwen and the Al Hassan, um, there are charges for sexual violence offenses, among other crimes. And recently, in a groundbreaking case that I presided on, Mr. Ntanganda, our, our, our accused, challenged the jurisdiction of the ICC <clears throat> to hear two criminal counts that he was charged with for sexual regarding sexual violence against child soldiers. His main argument was that since the children were members of the same group, the same rebel group, which is Mr. <clears throat> Tangandas, they could not be said to have been raped by the perpetrators who are also members of the same group under international, international law. And that, uh, of course, in his argument, that this was not an international crime, but a domestic one. And we are here talking about failures of systems, judiciaries at national level. And if we are going to fold our arms and say to Mr. Ntanganda, yes, we agree with you, which domestic court is going to try this, these two um, offenses? Where, where, where are the domestic courts? And this is exactly what we are talking about here. About here. Happily, my colleagues agreed with me and we ruled against Mr. Ntanganda and he's now being tried for those two offenses. But uh, at the end of it all, we have to ask ourselves, what has gone wrong? How do we correct it? Why are rebels doing what they are doing? Why are some of the governments doing what, what, what they are doing? Are the ICCs of this world the answer? And um, I think we, we, these are some of the things that we, going forward, we need to, to ask ourselves. <clears throat> now, I, I'm just about to finish. <laughs> I'll skip, um, uh, skip some of the things, but I want to draw your attention to three challenges. There are many, many challenges at international level. The first one is the United, the United Nations Security Council, at least as far as the International Criminal Court is concerned. Um, the UNSC has a lot of power under the Rome Statute. They can refer a situation like Syria because we do not have the jurisdiction to go into Syria. But as you know, politics has taken over. On the one hand, they refer Libya to the ICC, and when the Syrian situation comes, two countries, two P5 members, block the referral. And now you wonder whether the Security Council is really serious about human rights about the rule of law, as we, are, as we are saying. The second one is the issue of immunities. Um, this is very topical. As you know, we have had two, um, a, president and, uh, a president and a vice president in, in the court. The, 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 the two gentlemen did not really query um, the fact that they were sitting presidents. But we have um, the, uh, the, the president of Sudan, uh, President al-Bashir. We are on the news every day. You all know that right now there's a big case that, that is before the ICC, Jordan, raising the issue of immunities. But uh, what is important here to note is that um, the African Union is looking at ways of um, approaching the International Court of Justice for an opinion on immunities. Our statute at Article 27 does not recognize immunities. And this was a provision that was decided by states and put into the 
Rome statute. So this is one of the things that, have, that might impact the operations of the ICC in the future. The African, the protocol establishing the criminal, um, the, the, the criminal component of the African Court on Human and People's Rights is also very clear. They have excluded immunities. No sitting president, vice president, somebody acting, or any other official can be taken before the African Court on Human and People's Rights. So what we remain with is a shell. It's only rebels who have nobody to, to, to talk on, the, on their behalf will be taken to the African Court. And then the, 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 the latest, as, as referred to, I think, by, by uh, Andrew, withdrawals. The moment the prosecutor opens her mind, mouth to say that I'm considering such and such a country, we wake up in the morning, they are withdrawing from the statute. I think these are threats, very th serious threats, to what we all thought was, um, was a noble cause. But I can assure you that uh, the ICC is becoming stronger by the day, and we will not relent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we have some time for questions, and uh, perhaps if you raise your hand, that if you would identify yourself and also to whom you are addressing your question. Um, well, I'm uh, Lydia Margosian from the National Council of Western Armenia. Uh, I'm addressing this question to uh, and in fact, all the members, because all the issues that you've raised were very important concerning the question I will be asking now. Uh, so if there is one of you uh, answering, I'd be very glad. So first of all, I would like to thank you for organizing this conference, which is uh, indeed vital for human rights. I would like to draw your attention upon the Treaty of Sèvres, a treaty which has been signed in 1920, but never been ratified. It's a peace treaty. Why I'm talking about this treaty? Because in order to close the First World War, it would have been necessary to ratify the five treaties of the suburb of Paris. But the Treaty of Sèvres is the only one among the five treaties which have not been ratified. So in fact, it means that we are still in the environment of the First World War. This explains, in consequence, the wars in the Middle East that we have now, and the ongoing occupation of Western Armenia by Turkey. So my question is, which are the mechanisms to ensure the end of these wars in the Middle East and to give the right of existence of the Armenians indigenous in Western Armenia people who has undergone genocide, considering that a peace treaty already exists, it is the Treaty of Sèvres. Thanks. <laughs> it, we're both professors of public international law, and therefore... Uh, yeah. You go first. Oh, no, no, Andrew, I'm the moderator. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Joshua Neal from uh, the Graduate Institute and from the Geneva Academy. Uh, my question is probably a bit more theoretical, but I hope it can have some practical uh, implication. Um, with the discussion of the rule of law, uh, I'm always tempted to think about um, a similar notion, which is, uh, I think, more prevalent, and that's the whole idea of the rule by law, which, in a sense, moves more in the direction uh, where you have the law actually being manipulated uh, to achieve uh, particular ends. And I think the difficulty with that is that sometimes it actually uh, looks like the rule of law. 
And why I raise that, and I think, is because it's been raised by some of uh, the presentations, especially uh, by uh, Mr. Ayala, Professor Clapan, and Galegos, uh, about you know the dangers where the law could actually be manipulated. And I think my big my question is: Aren't we dealing with a much larger problem uh, beyond the rule of law? Uh, that in some instances where we feel comforted that we have some sense of a rule of law, we actually have a bigger problem of a rule by law which we'll uh, need to address as well in this wider conversation. Carlos, do you want to deal with that? Yeah. I am indigenous, indigenous people. I, I would like to speak in French because we, we are in the terri French territory, okay? You have to take pity on this poor American. Uh, uh, we don't have really translation for people, but most people here do. Never, never speak in French. No, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, my question is, uh, Professor of uh, Human Rights Commission, you stated Venezuela, Venezuela government, Venezuelan government is elected by the people as pre President Maduro, as President Chavez, the Western countries supported the, the uh, violation of human rights in Venezuela. The opposite of government is supported by the by the uh, Union European. Many uh, desertor is condecorated by diploma of Sakharov. Other question: What did you th think about about new aggression against the Syria? against the Syrian people by the three imperialistic country. It is grave violation of human rights charter, of international law. Thank you, My, thank you very much. On the Treaty of Sev. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of the Treaty of Serve for reasons of my own inadequacy, but what I want to suggest is that even um, an unratified treaty like that, that refers to crimes that have been committed, those crimes have been committed whether or not the treaty becomes ratified. The treaty doesn't create the crimes. And so, because clearly they happened before the treaty existed, and that would, wouldn't make sense if the treaty creates the crime after the events. And I think one of the fortes of using international criminal law is that these are crimes which have no statute of limitations. So somebody who is raped in the context of an armed conflict and it's rape as a war crime, we hope that eventually, it, if um, appropriate, it's prosecuted in the ICC. But it remains a crime of what we call crime of universal jurisdiction, which other states could choose to prosecute at any time in the future. And so one of the things that we were trying um, to do in the reports on South Sudan is whether or not there is a hybrid court with jurisdiction over these crimes, or whether or not they are prosecuted in South Sudan. These are crimes which can be prosecuted elsewhere around the world, and if it doesn't happen this year or in 10 years' time, it could happen in 20 years' time, because they are serious international crimes. And we are here in the city of Geneva, and some of you who read the Tribune de Genève may be following the prosecution of a Guatemalan police chief who is being prosecuted for events in Guatemala, but in Geneva, with no particular connection to Geneva except the fact that he came through here. 
And so I think the message from international criminal law can be very powerful, that we have a permanent international criminal court with judges who, have you heard, as you've heard, are very determined uh, to do their job. And we have a complementarity so that other states can prosecute these crimes. What I wanted to hint at before is that we need to be careful about saying we must therefore get it into the genocide box or the crimes against humanity box, because that's where international criminal law is. And in fact, I don't think it has to be there. I think we can also use the crime of torture, torture also being in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And most states around the world are parties, and they can prosecute torture. And to concentrate on overly describing it as aggression or crime against humanity or genocide is a bit of a distraction. And for the woman who's been attacked or raped, to, to say we need to know about their genocidal intent rather than to concentrate on her rape or indeed her right to property or the cooking utensils is we're missing the bigger picture and that, that was really um, my message. And I'll stop there, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, did you want to deal with the uh, notion of the rule by law as opposed to rule of law? Normally I get the tough questions. <laughs> I think you have a, a very clear notion that we have been saying here, and I think all, most of the panel has been, has been saying that the use of law, uh, uh, the use of the law for purposes whatever uh, besides justice and, and, uh, and normative aspects is something that we are all concerned about. Uh, the, you, you, you stated very well the, the difference, the rule by law and the rule of law. I, I agree with you that there is an enormous preoccupation that law is used for different circumstances. We have particular cases in nations, but even, even others, where the law has been an instrument of, of regression and suppression and, uh, and violation of human rights. Uh, my, my concern is that many of the countries who are applying this as state parties of conventions or violating those conventions. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk about torture, when we talk about the Convention Against Torture in the human rights field, uh, many uh, of the intricacies that were just mentioned here can be applicable. Uh, but uh, there are, uh, in, in that realm, a sense of soft law. So we have gotten to the point where we have 10 treaties and we're looking for more that are enforceable human rights treaties in, in, in other fields like the, the Initiative of Ecuador on, the, on, on human rights and transnational corporation and businesses. Uh, that will create a basis of discussion on the issue of human rights and uh, the remedies they must apply uh, to human beings that are affected by this. Now, if we evolve, and, and, and the notion that law will evolve positively into creating a structure which will, will, will make it an obligation for the states, then, then we have a notion of having a structure. Even with the structure, the preoccupation is that if it is used unwisely or if it is permitted to be used unwisely, or as I have stated in my, in my brief intervention, there are countries who choose to be the ones that have the notion of what is right and wrong, in spite of what we have agreed internationally. And that puts in risk the peace of the world and our notion of equity and our notion of justice. Uh, the gentleman had two questions. One of them is, I got the gist that uh, uh, Mr. Maduro was uh, democratically elected and so forth. and. Uh, some nasty people from the north and so forth. Of the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can comment on that. Uh, the fact of being elected does not give the um, power to destroy the rule of law and democracy. Uh, being elected does not necessarily mean that the government is a democracy. You can read Article 3 and 4 of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, which has the 
over 20 elements, key elements of democracy, one of them being fair and free elections, but it's not the only element. Remember that in history, and I don't want to name the names, but the major dictators were popularly elected. So it's not enough when you are elected. Now, what I said after that is that now that the government has lost its majority in Venezuela, they didn't want to comply with the recall referendum stated in the Constitution, the recall referendum for the president. They illegalize the political parties. They disqualify uh, not only Leopoldo Lopez, but Capriles as well as the major opposition leaders. So how can you have free and fair elections? And I can mention over 30 key elements uh, that has been posed by the uh, civil society in Venezuela. How can you have free and fair elections uh, when people cannot elect freely? Uh, but I want to stress that even a government which has been elected cannot go on above the constitution and destroy the rule of law. Not even using the excuse that they want to overcome the problems of the people, because at the end, what you get is no rule of law, no social rights, no economic right, no civil rights, and people is starving and dying. So rule of law, as I said before, is for the common people. Without rule of law, common people cannot resort, cannot protest, cannot express their opinions. And that's why I meant by um, the rule of law as a concept that goes, that includes elections, but goes beyond elections. Uh, that's what I can comment on, on the question. And, and um, Andrew, I think, is going to comment on the Syria question as well. And you, Bob, perhaps. Uh, no, 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 I, I, I defer <laughs> to that. Uh, uh, I will say this, Andrew, before I came over, uh, and I was up in my hotel room, and I switched on the BBC, and uh, it, uh, uh, Mrs. May was delivering remarks that quite clearly were prepared by the legal advisor. Uh, and it sounded like something that uh, some of my old professors, uh, in a justification of the use of uh, humanitarian intervention and proportionality and so forth, and, uh, and arguing this. So you brought it up a little bit, and uh, so we can close with your observations on this. Um, yeah, I, I brought it up, so I suppose I have to deal with it now. Um, it's true that the British uh, argument is that there is an exception under customary international law that allows for humanitarian intervention when you are trying to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe. Now, we won't be able to resolve whether or that not that exists in customary international law here. What I was suggesting is that the problem with some of the rules on the use of force and the problem with complaining about a violation of the UN Charter is that we don't have the secondary role, rules for bringing somebody into compliance. And so we can have a long discussion about whether the charter was violated, but what, what's the compliance mechanism? And that's got to be part of our approach to the rule of law, not just whether the, the rule was violated, but do we have a mechanism for bringing somebody back into compliance or punishing them? And what I was suggesting is that the ICC is a bit exceptional in that it is a compliance mechanism, and you can uh, prosecute someone. But I don't want to end on a sad note, but it's true that those states which are tempted to engage in the use of force in a questionable situation that arguably could be aggression are not accepting the jurisdiction of the ICC over the crime of aggression. And they know that they're not going to accept it because they want to reserve themselves this right. And so we do have a bit of a problem with the rule of law if, and I apologize to the German ambassador, but I hope this will make the point, if Germany, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland were the three states that we were dealing with, and they decided to engage in airstrikes on Austria, 
then we have a situation where the ICC could probably deal with this. So we do have a bit of a rule of law for, I'm going to call them the, the good people, um, those who are prepared to accept the jurisdiction of the ICC, and we don't have an effective rule of law enforcement mechanism for the others, and that is a bit of a problem if we're looking at this in the context of, of universality. But thinking about it as an ICC problem, I think, might help to sharpen the focus, because the ICC, they won't remember this, but they did actually send me to the conference to deal with the aggression amendment in Kampala. And so I was lucky enough to sit in on some of the negotiations. And in fact, there was an attempt by some states to say, let's have a humanitarian intervention exception. And there are texts which you can find in the very good um, book by Klaus Kraus, Klaus Kress, sorry, who has uh, documented all of this, where somebody wrote out a paragraph that said, if we're responding to genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes, then we are entitled to use force. But that was rejected in the Kampala conference. And the crime of aggression, as written down and adopted now, does not allow for such an exception. So whether or not it exists at the interstate level, it wouldn't necessarily protect an individual from a prosecution. And I think by, by shifting the discussion to that kind of level of enforcement, you might actually focus people's minds. Thank you. Uh, before we conclude, uh, let me just say something on behalf of, of our organization as we're dealing with the rule of law. Uh, we recently concluded a meeting, a uh, biannual meeting of our uh, executive committee uh, where the issue of the assault on the rule of law was the central theme. And what I can tell you is, is that unlike most other human rights organizations in the world, from its inception, the ICJ has been dedicated to enhancing the rule of law around the world. And we have done the hard work over the years of working with judges and lawyers in increasing capacity and so forth uh, of the justice system. But our understanding, if you look at our literature, is just not the judiciary. The rule of law deals with a central tenet of any just society, not only equal protection and equal access, but it is something that protects the vulnerable. And because when you do not have the rule of law and restraint on the exercise of authority, you have disorder. And it is simply that. And it was our feeling that we are uniquely positioned to tackle these problems, to reaffirm the centrality of the notion of the rule of law in society and so forth. And uh, we will undertake certain projects as we did after 9-11, when graciously hosted by the German government in Berlin not too long ago, we issued the Berlin Declaration with some fundamental principles that were meant to guide states and how they were to conduct their counterterrorism policies with respect to observance of fundamental human rights principles as well as IHL and refugee law also were relevant. And that gave rise to the EJP panel on terrorism, counterterrorism, and human rights, which undertook a four-year study and documented the abuses that were committed by states, including major Western states, and on this continent, who aided and abetted these things, in the name of countering terrorism, where the notion was it was a new threat, everything was new, human rights was an obstacle, the gloves had to come off. And we confronted that and we issued that report and so forth, and I believe it had an impact. And so uh, something that is so central to what the ICJ is, and I said this is unlike any other human rights group in the world, this is at the core of our existence and what we do. We will be addressing this 
and we will have initiatives, and for some of the governments who have representatives here, we will be knocking on your doors to try to get some assistance and so forth so we can carry out these absolutely fundamental things. This is not north-south, east-west. This is now becoming endemic. So I want to thank again our host at the Graduate Institute for providing this, again, to the representatives of the government of Germany and so forth for their support. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>